Lord, you'll be glorified through the study, no matter what, who the participants are. Um, we're thankful for it, and we love you, and we're excited to be here. Pray that you would guide us in all the things that you want us to learn. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 Okay, so what is the enigma of Jesus' three closest men, Peter, James, and John? Now, to get the total history of this, this is one of the most fascinating things that's happening in the New Testament. We've talked about this before, but I want to reset the working parts. you got to look at the power dynamics that's going on in the early church. And, you know, Jesus basically, you know, you know, there's this, there's this struggle going on between Jesus' three closest men. All of them are very proud, okay? All of them are power hungry. And Jesus makes it clear that he's going to build his rock upon Peter. That's what he basically says at one point. And, you know, there's still this power dynamic between John and Peter, as, you know, John's talking about, um, you know, he's laying on Jesus's chest. He's at Jesus's left at the Last Supper. He makes it clear that he beats Peter and Tim. There is this dynamic going on with the power struggle between the sons of Zebedee and Peter. And basically, as the church starts and we go, start going into Acts, James gets set up as the bishop. In, in Jerusalem, he's the main guy. He actually becomes the leader of the church. So it's kind of interesting that James takes this position and Peter actually is uh, not in, as prominent. So already the structure of what Christ has, has decided when you get into put into the hands of men gets a little twisted. And, uh, and so basically James is in charge and he's the main honcho dude. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, Paul comes along. You know, Jesus didn't foretell anything about Paul or about Paul being some leader. And then Paul starts writing all the books of the Bible. He becomes this prominent guy in Acts who has seen Jesus, uh, you know, uh, and, and a separate vision and ends up becoming one of the massive leaders of the church. And then he gets into an issue with James where, where they're facing off now. Because he starts calling James, and fr fr frankly, John, who's following James, starts calling them the party of the circumcision. So here we have Paul now, who wasn't even foretold that he was going to be any, any big guy here, casted into this middle of this big battle uh, into the church. And then we're going to see at the end what God decides to do about all of it. In my opinion, what God decides to do about all of it. And so here we are. Let's start with. You know, how are we sure these three were his closest men? How do we know that? Can you zoom in a little on the document? Uh, no, I actually can't because I had I couldn't uh, use it at home. So I don't know. There's no zoom in feature that I can do on this. At the bottom of my, there's no bottom zoom in deal. Sorry. It's okay. So I can't, can't do it. Um, anyway, so let's look at the special invitations of these three men. Let's go to... Uh, Mark chapter five. These three men have special invitations all the time to be involved. In 533. Okay. So um, someone want to read that? Oh, yeah. You froze for a minute. You may have to put the document back up. You've got to reshare the doc. Really? Okay. Um, how weird. It's not, uh, it's not, it doesn't give me the menu. Where well, The menu has stopped. Have you do, do at the bottom? Click on share screen. The menu. There's no menu on the bottom anymore. It's all disappeared. Go back to uh, the Zoom wherever Zoom is. What's that? Go back to wherever Zoom is. I thought you had a tab open. There is no. There's no. Uh, how weird. There's no place for me to uh, get to the menu. Just pause the recording. 
Can't do that either. There's no menu. Oh, okay. So can you click on the Zoom app so you're inside, so you're looking, are you looking at yourself and you're looking at us right now inside the Zoom? Yeah. And there's nothing popping up at the bottom? There's nothing popping up at the bottom. It's, I've lost, that's when I froze, it just disappeared. Oh, okay. Um, uh, maybe if you log out and log back in, we can just kind of start from the beginning and dive into the first verse. Okay. Yeah, That's right. weird. Why would it, why would we still be up and I wouldn't have the menu? The menu has got to be here somewhere. There. Okay. Now it showed up. Okay. Now is it being shared? Yeah. Okay. We're good. Okay. So go back to Mark. 533. But the woman fearing and trembling aware of what had happened to her came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. While he was still speaking, they came from the house of the synagogue official, saying, Your daughter has died. Why trouble the teacher anymore? But Jesus, overhearing what was being spoken, said to the synagogue official, Do not be afraid any longer. Only believe. And he allowed no one to accompany him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the synagogue official. And we'll keep going. Yeah. And he saw till wind. The end of verse 38. Okay. He saw commotion and the people loudly weeping and wailing. All right. So Jesus specifically for, tell, doesn't let the other disciples come. He only lets Peter, James, and John come to this. This is kind of like on the job training. This is kind of like interns at the hospital watching operations, right? So here's a case where everyone's excluded, but Peter, James, and John. Go to Matthew 17. Start in verse uh, one. Mm, go to where? Go to verse uh, six. Six days after Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was trans uh, transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his garments became white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, is it good for us to be here? If you wish, I will make three tabernacles here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, the voice over the cloud said, this is my beloved son with whom I will please listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face to the ground and were terrified. All right. So everyone else is speechless except who? Peter. He's got a whole plan. And, you know, hey, let me build some tabernacles. I'll make one for you, one for them, and one for him. And then we'll, we'll all have fun, you know. So Peter's the only one speaking out here. Always Peter in his presumptuousness. But bottom line here is the transfiguration. Only three of his closest men are there. Uh, go to, uh, and then he asked for their comfort in the garden. Go to Matthew 26. Peter, Matthew 26. Just always trying to do too much. <laughs> and just go to verse uh, 36 to uh, 41, oh, 40, uh, 42. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. And he went a little beyond them and fell on his face and prayed, saying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but you as you will. And he came up to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so you men could not keep watch with me for one hour. Keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went again a second time and prayed, saying, My father, if this cannot pass away unless I drink it, you will be, your will be done. Again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy, and he left them again and went away and prayed a third time, saying the same thing once more. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand and the son of man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us be going. Behold, the one who betrays me is at hand. 
So Jesus is actually reaching out to the closest men now. He's like saying, okay, I've taken you with me. I've ministered to you. I showed you what I'm going to do. Now I need you. I need you just for one hour. And uh, they fail him. And he even wakes them up. Hey, I need you. And they keep falling back asleep. So in this particular case, they're not even there for him at all. Uh, but, you know, here's the three that he trusted in. Even in this time of need, it's these three that he's looking, looking to. So these guys are definitely important in Jesus' life. And then John resting his head and sitting right next to him. And John chapter 13, we're not going to go and read that for time's sake. But the bottom line is John's leaning on Jesus. He's just resting his head right on his bosom. As Jesus says, he's about to be portrayed. And then John is the only disciple at Jesus' tomb. Uh, turn to uh, John 19, not Jesus' tomb, but uh, uh, John is at um, his um, at the cross. That shouldn't be tomb there. So turn to John chapter 19 and read uh, 25 through 27. So John was the only one brave enough to be there at, at uh, Jesus' uh, uh, crucifixion. Mm. Therefore, the soldiers did these things. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus went and saw his mother, wait, wait, when Jesus then saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. From that hour, the disciple took her into his own household. So Jesus basically, you know, gave John the responsibility of taking care of his mother. I mean, that's how important John was to Jesus and how much he trusted him. So it's very interesting. And then uh, let's look at the last separate preparation. Go to Luke chapter 22, verses 7 through 9. Then came the first day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. And Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare the Passover for us so that we may eat it. They said to him, where do you want us to prepare it? And he said to them, when you have entered the city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into that house that he enters. And you shall say to the owner of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large furnished upper room prepared there. Okay. So who does he uh, basically ask to prepare the Last Supper? Peter and John. Yeah. I mean, these guys are right there at his ministry all of the time. And uh, if you're reading carefully, uh, they're the ones involved in everything that he's doing, apart from the 12. Um, and then James and John are given special mention in the picking of all the disciples. Matthew, Mark, go to Mark 13. Mark 3, excuse me, Mark 3, 13 through 17. Um, and he went up to the mountain and summoned those whom he himself wanted, and they came to him. And he appointed 12 so that he would, so that they would be with him, and that he could send them out to preach and have, and to have authority to cast out demons. And he appointed the 12, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, and James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to him he gave the name Bone Nergs. So Bone Nergs. His name was Bone Nergs. Mm hmm bone nerves, which means son of thunder. Well, and Andrew and Philip and Bartholomew and Matthew and Thomas and James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus and Simon, the zealot and Judas Iscariot, whom betrayed him. All right. So the special mention of those three, other than basically pointing out that Judas betrayed him, basically there's special attachments to those three. Here he calls the, the two he mentioned specifically, he calls them the sons of thunder. You know, obviously these guys are controversial. And then he mentions that, uh, he mentions Peter separately, who, you know, he called him Simon, whom he gave the name Peter. 
So those three are given special mention, even in the picking of the whole issue. So let's look at the dynamics of, uh, of James and John. Uh, we've talked about this before, but we've never pointed out that John was also involved in the party of the circumcision. So go to uh, Galatians. Galatians chapter 2. Starting in verse 6 and going to verse 14. For from those who were of high reputation, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. While those who were of reputation contributed nothing to me. But on the contrary, seeing that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised. For he who effectually worked for Peter and his apostleship to the circumcised effectually worked for me also to the Gentiles. And recognizing the grace that had been given to me, James and Cephas and John, Oh, that was it. Sorry. I keep going. Yeah. Oh, who were reputed to be pillars gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship so that we might go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. They only asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I also was eager to do. Okay. So we go on to point out that the party of the circumcision basically tries to exclude Gentiles. And in this particular case, John's mentioned supposedly what Paul says is a pillar. And how much did these men of faith, these pillars of God, help Paul, according to this passage? I'm sorry, say that one more time. How much these pillars of the faith who, after Paul was revealed that Paul was a disciple, uh, Paul was an apostle, that how much did they help him, according to verse 6? Nothing. Nothing. They didn't give him a thing. So this is already going on. The, un the unfolding and the unraveling of God's church already, the seeds are sown for death at this point to, to the church. Uh, and why God allows this um, is just uncertain, except the fact that God understands that, that men are weak and he's going to use them to his own glory anyway. Go to Acts chapter 15. And again, this is really not something you're going to hear uh, in the body of Christ, that the church is all disgruntled and upset with each other and not working together and fighting amongst each other and infighting, because it makes no sense. Everybody wants to have everything perfect and that there's some glorious deal. And they want to they want to put up... Uh, some deal as if the church was in some glorious array when already it's slipping away before it's even formed. So Acts chapter 15, verses one through three. Some men came down from Judea and began teaching the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And Paul and Barnabas had great dissension and debate with them. The brethren determined that Paul and Barnabas and some others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders concerning this issue. Therefore, being sent on their way by the church, they were passing through both Phoenica yeah, and Samaria, describing the detail in detail the conversation of the Gentiles and were bringing great joy to all the brethren. Keep going. When they arrived at Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who had believed stood up saying, is it necessary to circumcise them and to direct them to observe the law of Moses? The apostles and the elders came together to look into this matter. After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brethren, you know that in the early days, God made a choice among you that by my mouth, the Gentiles would hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows their heart, testified to them, giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he also did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. Now, okay. therefore, why do you put God to the test by placing upon the neck of the disciples a yoke which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? 
Okay, so it says here that uh, some men came down from Judea and began teaching the brethren unless you were circumcised. And then it says that all the apostles and the elders came together. So that would be the people in Jerusalem. So that includes John. John would have been there. Does John say anything at this meeting? No, he's silent. There's really nothing that he communicates at this meeting. And so basically what you have here is John cows when James is present, although he's following him through the whole deal. It's very interesting. Let's look at the failures of James and John. Go to Mark chapter 10, uh, verses 35. James what? Mark 10, verse 35. Verse 35. Mm -hmm. Do what? Just 35? Yeah. Okay. Well, okay, now go, go all the way to uh, 38. James and John, the two sons of Zebedee, came up to Jesus saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. Um, and he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to them, Grant that we, may be, that we may sit, one on your right, one on your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized in the baptism which I am baptized? And, this, and they said to him, We are able. Yeah, we can do it. We and can Jesus do it. The cup I drink, you shall drink, and you shall be baptized with the baptism with I am baptized. But to sit on my right or my left, this is not mine to give, but is for those whom had it, whom it has been prepared. Ooh. Well, this um, that's cool. This is not saying, you know, look, look at how they start out. Um, hey Jesus, we want you to do whatever we ask you. Can you do that, please? And then it's like. Um, this is an amazing thing you're asking. Can you actually share the cup, the actual authority that I'm about to take on? And the answer is, yeah, we think so. We're good. So this is the temperament of these two guys that are Jesus' closest men. Uh, go to Luke chapter 9, uh, verse 51 through 56. You said Isaiah? Luke, oh. chapter 9, verse 51 through 56. When the days were approaching for his ascension, he was determined to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers on ahead of him, and they went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make arrangements for him. But they did not receive him because he was traveling toward Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? He, but he turned and rebuked them and said, you do not know what kind of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went on to another village. Okay, just because they said, no, you can't come in, right? They, here's, what, here's what James and John come up with. <laughs> <laughs> I, the men of mercy, the sons of thunder. Guys just literally have no compassion whatsoever. Okay. Um, and then we've already read that they fell asleep three times while they're on Jesus, watching for Jesus. He wanted them to be around and they couldn't even stay awake for an hour. Then they become the party of the circumcision, demanding people to follow the law. These are Jesus' closest men. Did they repent of these sins? Do you think? If you go to John's epistle, John's epistle is all about love and coming together and having love being the number one concern. So when you take a look at the later of John's end of, end of John's life, I think John repents. I think he clearly presents love as the most important thing and not judgment. Uh, and if you look at James, what does James say was one of the most important sins that you shouldn't be committing in the Bible? James talks a lot about it. And he talks about humbling yourself so that God may raise you up. Oh, and like the tongue? The tongue. Same thing. Like idolatry. Idolatry is a big one. 
Yeah, saying things you shouldn't be saying and also pride. Pride is a big issue in James, not having pride. One whole chapter, uh, chapter five is dedicated to pride. And he talks about not having pride, that the pride is your main downfall and humble yourself before God. So I think by the end of their lives, they had both addressed these issues, although the, they had sown in the death of the early um, church as far as the organizational structure before the end of the first century. And I think on purpose, God decides, okay, this is enough infection. We're going we're gonna to go ahead and deal with this. Go to, um, go to Acts chapter 12 and read verses 1 through 3. Now about that time, Herod the king laid hands on some who belonged to the church in order to mistreat them. And he had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword. When he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. Now it was during the days of the unleavened bread. All right. So notice that he's going to probably try and kill Peter too, right? But the first disciple to have be taken out is James. And I think it's interesting that Peter's life is spared. So in this particular case, I think it's God saying two things. One, there's enough, there's enough discord being sown. We're going to take James out. And so James is taken out. And in between this time that he's obviously written the epistle, but the fact that he allows Peter to remain on is because basically he's saying, hey, Peter's in charge. End of story. So James being taken out leaves a huge vacancy uh, in Jerusalem. And I believe John probably filled that spot. But I believe God did decide that we're, this is enough dissension. James is gone. And boom, he's gone. So, um, and this, this is not a history you're going to hear, period. This is not something that's going to be assembled in the body of Christ to hear that God is taking out lead people. And I believe it's God. I think that oh, that's the only reason it could possibly be mentioned here, that God, God is allowing this to happen, obviously, because God is, you know, sovereign. So, but we have this mess happening of sowing in uh, basically legalism into the body of Christ. And basically having Paul, Paul, who's not one of the original disciples, has to sort it out. He has to basically confront them and say, this is wrong. Why are you doing this? Why are you going back into legalism? Very fascinating stuff. So what were their special talents that God chose them to such as high honor? You know, why would God do it? You know, if you take a look at the three that God chose, they're very presumptuous. They're very proud. It seems like people who have these types of temperaments end up being in positions of leadership. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. God chooses these precocious, out of turn, uh, abrasive men who he has to fine tune and take the corners off and present them in the body of Christ. I'm certainly not like any of those things. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, I feel like I'm a lot like Peter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Literally, as we're talking about him, I'm like, oh, I'm definitely always trying to do too much, speaking too soon. Speaking at a turn and going, what? Natalie. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so here's the interesting thing here. So so what is the specific talents and why did God choose to love these, that Jesus loved these guys more than any other men? And the answer is he didn't. He chose them strictly because he loved them. And the one thing we need to remember is that God's choice, according even to Paul said, I don't care what the pillars of these men were. God shows no partiality. It's like no one is special. No one. The fact that Jesus bestowed these specific gifts on these three men and spent so much time with them. It's just because he decided to love them. He confided in them. And he decided to set them up as part of his ministry. And decided to be committed to them. Period. Just as we do. Just as we pick people that we love and want next to us. It's not something that we favor them over others. We just decide to commit to them. We find something in them we love. And we decide to love them. There's no partiality shown with God. There's no special people over anybody else. God certainly shows favor and love to certain human beings, but they don't get any 
you know, it's it's not that they've done anything. The point is, when God says God shows no partiality, it doesn't mean he doesn't show favor. He does. It just means that they didn't get do anything to deserve it. Mm -hmm. That's what it means. So when you say, oh, God, what do you, what do you mean God shows no partiality? Look at all the special favors he gave to David. The fact that he gave David breach room has nothing to do with showing partiality. It has to do with David is no one more special than anybody else. Yeah. So that's what you got to remember here. We don't want, we got to quit worshiping and building up these big men of faith, supposedly. When you read, look at these actual books, the Maxim Cato books and other books that come out and build up these guys into such uh, amazing men. You know, it's like, they're not amazing men. They were men filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, just like us with all kinds of, of, of problems and issues. And you see them all sewn into the early church. These are just guys having fights and feuds and childish antics going on just like the rest of us. And that God sorts these things out and, uh, and we have to deal with the results uh, you know, of the after effects that, you know, the church, you know, a big, a big uh, um, radioactive bomb exploded in the first century. And we still have the fallout of these effects happening in the body of Christ today. Wasn't it almost like the only thing that we can know for sure is that like, we're all going to mess it up. Basically we are all here on the place, face of the planet because of the grace of God. And God knows all of our weaknesses and he fills those gaps and basically loves us and provides the difference. Where you have the problem is when you start to exclude God from the process and thinking that you have something happening on Sunday morning, that's amazing. And that's where the pride filters in. That's where the party of the circumcision comes in. That's where the, why we have that lesson in here. Don't become people of the law. And we have it happening on a mass scale worldwide. And what people are calling legalism today is the exact opposite of what legalism is in the body of Christ. Legalism has become pointing out sin. That's legalism. When legalism is actually uh, telling people not to do things that the Bible is silent about. Excluding people from doing things because of your own personal preferences about what you think is right and wrong. And so these are the things that were sown into the early church and that war we're warned about in Matthew 13, about what causes leaven in the body of Christ. You're saying, you said that legalism is not pointing out sin. No, but it legalism is not pointing out sin. It's not. That's not legalism. Pointing out sin is scriptural. But people are saying legalism is pointing out sin. That's what the modern church is saying. Telling people that they shouldn't be sinning in the body of Christ and pointing it out uh, is biblical. And people are saying, no, no, that's legalism. This whole idea of what grace is supposed to be is basically doing whatever you want to do. And you have freedom of the body of Christ and no one can tell you what to do or not to do because that upsets your freedom is false doctrine. That's false grace. And, and John MacArthur wrote a whole book about it. It's called The Gospel According to Jesus. Totally worth the read. Uh, we're gonna, I'm going to quote some things from it in the coming weeks. But basically the idea is that, look, if you've received Christ, whether you've been baptized or not, there's nothing else you have to do. And it doesn't matter what kind of lifestyle you live. You are saved, period, because there's no works involved. So a life of discipline is not an important issue. Uh, if you know, it's just a, just getting decisions is all that's important in the last days. That's become the thing in the body of Christ, which leads to the next thing. If we just fill the pews as much as we can get. Then the important thing is to make sure just everyone gives ten percent, so we can build this ministry. That's become like the caricature of the modern church and the goal. Yeah, and I guess that does make sense too with like with your faith. It comes down to your faith, your belief, right? Yeah. In the way you love, but that really is the essence of the Christian life, which makes us different than other people is living a life of discipline. Like you said, like when you put it that way, I feel like it might be easier for people to understand because it's like people understand that being Buddhist is a discipline. 
And that's yeah. totally fine. But if you're disciplined in Christianity, you're, that's not okay. Yeah. I mean, the whole point, and I've talked about this before, and I like to bring this up again and again, because it's interesting that in our culture, God allowed that whole Star Wars thing to present the idea that living for the, for the light, you know, living for the light side or, 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 or not living to the dark side that you couldn't just believe in the force one way or the other. You, in order to serve the force, you had to basically become a disciple. You had to go through a training. You had to become a Jedi if you wanted to have any intimate relationship with the force, uh, at least the, 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 you know, the bright side, the light side of the force. And uh, I mean, we go, we go through the whole movie. Of the, I mean, the whole thing is about the training and the Jedi and, and, how, and the instincts and all the things you got to learn and the weapon training and all of it. And then all of a sudden, the modern church steps up and says, even the later ones, oh, you know what? That's discriminatory. There are people who want to believe who don't have the ability to be disciplined. So we're going to make it easy for them. All you got to do is believe. Now you don't need any training and you'll get all the powers. It's interesting that we have that played out which is a caricature of the modern church in Star Wars. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was in crisis in that movie. I was bugged when I saw that. That what? You just got to believe now? The whole Jedi thing's out the window? The whole point of the, you know, the last Jedi and all that is about the discipline of those, those knights who believed in uh, discipleship and, believe in, in, you know, following the force, you know, kind of like samurai. And now it's like, that. Eh, none of that matters. You know, let's just make it simple, okay? So that people can just, you know, share Christ with them. You know, they believe we don't have to test their faith and they can do whatever they want to do. And um, we're good. We're good to go. So it's important to remember these messages because these messages basically are showing that the sowing of the church and, you know, that, that, Basically, the issues that were happening in the first century caused the issues that continue to plague us today in the body of Christ. These men were already sowing discord and all kinds of issues into the body of Christ, the very leaders of the church. People who had spent three years with Jesus Christ. And only one man was able to stand up against it. Who, would, who, didn't, who didn't serve with Jesus Christ. And basically say, what are you guys doing? Why are you doing this? It ended up being that they were cliquish, just like the modern churches, separating themselves from the Gentiles. John and James and Peter all having their little uh, close little uh, uh, click, click game, eating together and separating themselves from the, from the Gentiles. I mean, just like we see in the body of Christ today. Mm. Trained men, the closest people to Jesus Christ. If they could do it, we should never put anybody on a pedestal. If those three couldn't, couldn't uh, do it, why would you place anybody else on a pedestal? We should always just you know, be hearing what's coming out of their mouth from the, from the standpoint of discipline and uh, what they know about God's word. And basically our, our love for them is it. As far as uh, you know, bowing down from a standpoint of respect, there's no one that is a, a, a beyond reproach uh, in the body of Christ today, based upon what we're seeing here, right? God's closest men. What yeah. they that message is there for a reason. That, hey, you know what? You are on a plank swimming towards shore. There is no one supporting you in the body of Christ in any, any big way that you can depend on. That's what the whole point of swimming on the plank separately toward shore is about. The ship is sinking, the tackle's thrown overboard, the, the wheat's thrown overboard, and the, and, the, and the pilot cannot save the ship. And that also makes sense why marriage is under attack as well, because technically your marriage, being in marriage, is the biggest example and beacon of light of your faith because you technically, you are one. It's the example that God is using on the earth to exemplify yeah. the church. And something like 70% of all men are committing adultery in a marriage. Because it's like... Is that true? Like, it's something 70, like 70%. 70% of men? 
I, yeah, look up the look up the ad. How many men have had an unfaithful arrangement in their marriage? It's something like 70, 7 out of ten. Wow, dang! I didn't know it was that high. It's a large number. It's over wow. half. That's wild. What about no, women? Physical, physical adultery. Seventy percent of all marriages, and that's only the people who admit it. Ooh. So. What about women? Yeah. Uh, women are in something like the forty percent range, believe it or wow. not, that have had extramarital affairs. That, um, and to you know, I don't know. I, I don't know if you actually put down emotional affairs where there actually is no sex. That the number is like even astronomical. Look it up. Do the stats. You'll you'll be blown away by it. Yeah, I mean, well, divorce is forty four percent, and so that makes sense that forty four percent of you know people there's something going on outside of it if they're not happy in the well that's why it's so detrimental when like a woman commits adultery because it's like almost like expected of a man it's like well he's got so many options it's hard for him not to but then it's like if a woman does it she's betraying everything and everybody and she's horrible well let's look for women who who actually does that but it's tied directly to their identity for men it's just sowing wild oats right it's for men, it's just they can't help themselves. With women, it's, you know, they're strictly whores when they do that. Yeah. You know, that's how society uh, puts the, the stigma on women and gives men the, um, the total pass. The problem is that, uh, you know, we have what's called disparate impact in mis misogyny. In other words, built into our belief system is a pass for men. Uh, is a what? Oh, a pass. A pass. We, we, we have all kinds of passes for men and no passes for women. Women are marked. And this is one of the reasons we have the women's movement. If, this, if we wouldn't have had this disparate, uh, basically misogyny built into our culture, the women's movement would have never gotten off the ground. Because if men had really taken care of women in the way that they said they were supposed to and really had their back, uh, no woman would mind being led by a man because he'd be taking care of her. The fact that men never took care of women in the ways that they, you know, basically said that they did from a standpoint, you know, of being, you know, knights, you know, in shining armor, basically beating them with their swords rather than protecting them with their swords, then we would not have it. The women's movement, did you know, was started by Christianity. Evangelical women started the women's movement, actually. It actually began in a place called Seneca Falls in the 1800s uh, because women were excluded. Listen to this. The women's movement seeds of Seneca Falls has to do with the fact that women wanted to be missionaries. And so in the Presbyterian Church. And they forbid them to be missionaries because they were women and they were not able to speak to men who were, who were English speaking because they were less than them. That was what the Presbyterian church said about women. But if they wanted to go to Africa and speak to inferior men, and as long as they weren't English speaking or, and white, then they could do that and be missionaries to Africa. That was the council of the Presbyterian church based upon women missionaries. That began the Seneca movement which began the Susan B. Anthony movement, which turned into politics, all of these women coming out of the Presbyterian church. Hmm. Wow, that's interesting. That's the roots of the women's movement. And did men deserve it? Absolutely. They deserved out that women actually had to go and retain rights because the actual leaders who are supposedly the church leaders are doing this kind of discriminatory crap to women. I think that is, that does clear it up for me a lot because I have this thing where it's like, I'm not a feminist. I'm not, for, well, I am a feminist because I believe that women and men should be equal, which is the actual definition of it, right? But it, it is responsibility ultimately to men because Q and I had this big debate and he just does not want to truly accept the full responsibility of that and that was all that I was trying to say is that like I'm not saying that men are horrible I'm saying that it did start with men 
Well, let, let me just say this. There's a difference and I'm, I'm, there's a difference between equality and roles. Okay? Yeah. And it's very important that we talked about this before that the roles between men and women are set by God. There's no, are, their brains are, you know, are, their brains are different. Their temperaments are different. Emotionally, they're different. That's all true. Okay. But that doesn't mean that men and women are not equal. Um, from a standpoint of roles, when you become a wife, you volunteer, okay, to take on that role. Doesn't change your equality. You volunteer. When you become an employee, you are subordinate to your employer, period. You volunteer to take on that role. It's, you voluntarily do it. And all roles in society are voluntary. Mm. And so when you take on the role of a man to take care of you and he has your back and he makes all, you know, basically the final decision and all that, that's a role you take on as a sub submissive wife. And a man also, according to Peter, is submissive to you because a man, the man leads from being a servant. Yeah. So my point, though, is roles do change based upon roles do change the relationship based upon you voluntarily submitting in yourself to that role. And what has been missed is that the idea is that men uh, put, place those roles upon women. Ready? involuntarily yep exactly that's my fight so when men place those roles on women involuntarily it becomes sexist yes mm. right that yes. a woman should should bow to all men you know that a woman should uh, all those roles are placed upon women who are not wives to those men that's the problem it's involuntary servitude period and that's the issue. And if the church would remember that, um, that that uh, feminism is 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 not monolithic, as and in the sense that it should apply across the board in every situation, it becomes an issue only in relation to what role you're in and what type of relationship do you have when you choose to be in that role. Yeah. Definitely. That is it.